Dante, Lena Whiskey Jack Nitsigason, Onis Kopoin Otsinia, Egua O Eotoskeano Tapas Nekia, I mean, uh, assistant professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of Women and Gender Studies. Uh, hello, my name is Lana Whiskey Jack. I am from Salt Lake Cree Nation and I'm a visual artist, a multidisciplinary visual artist, or also known as a skull artist meaning I bring my arts practices into my scholarship as a community engaged researcher and educator. I, um, I have been researching um, Iskwewewen, womanhood, for over 15 years, ever since my undergraduate into my master's and, and um, into my doctorate, which I uh, attained my doctorate degree from University of Luke Wills. Um, three years ago. Blue Quills is a pretty special place. It's a place where I've reconnected to Nehiawewen, the language, um, our ceremonies, our indigenous ways of knowing and being, especially in the education um, context. And, uh, but it also has a long history since it, um, it was built in 1931 as Blue Quills Indian Residential School, where two generations of the wombs I come from attended. It has a, you know, it has some very negative and traumatic impacts on my life because of the disconnection. Um, those schools, uh, you know, fragmented within our family systems, our kinship systems, our ceremonies, our language, our connection to the land. And, um, but it also is a place of, of great healing and reclaiming our sacredness and our medicine since its takeover in 1971 when our, our peoples, 11 different First Nations, came together to do a sit in and take over that school. And so it has a beautiful history of, of you know, coming full circle of being a place of so much trauma, but also being a place of so much of coming into our own power, coming into our personal agency. And so I think, you know, it's so important to introduce myself in my language of connecting to Nehiawewen because I'm acknowledging the wombs I come from, you know, Nitsigason and Otsinia, my name is and I'm from. Uh, the root words of those is Utsi or Nitsi, my belly button. And so when I'm uttering those Cree words, I am honoring and respecting the wounds I come from. And who are, you know, they, they're definitely stories of reclaiming um, personal agency and sovereignty over our own bodies. Like I think of, uh, and through, especially through art, my mother was, uh, uh, does does a lot of traditional arts and um, my nukum she was a wonderful uh, quilt maker and she made blankets for all of us grandchildren and um, great grandchildren and her own children and she had over 50 grandchildren so you know the amount of love she had to give through her art practices was incredible and she was also a midwife she was a uh, a singer, um, a dirty storyteller, <laughs> you know, she, she had a lot to share and she was definitely one of the, a strong human being, both physically, mentally, spiritually, and, um, um, you know, emotionally, she was my rock. So I'm, I'm so glad to, to, it makes me happy to acknowledge, uh, say my name and where I am from because it's through her that I, I, I know who I am. So we come from a long history of, you know, oppressive, colonized, patriarchal policies, you know, from the disenfranchisement of indigenous women of this land. Our women were, you know, they were this, the leaders of our families and communities of our nations. They were the ones who gave guidance to our men and um, and helped our, you know, they, they're the ones who nurtured, especially our grandmothers, who nurtured and educated our young and grandfathers, um, who educated and nurtured our younger generation. And I mean, Nookum Caroline was that for me, of um, saving me um, through her, her fierce love and her strong spiritual teachings. 
So I did a uh, seven year sexual health research project within my community. And some of the biggest lessons I've learned from that research on sexual health, as, um, specifically on why sexually transmitted infections were increasing within our communities, is that one, uh, we've normalized sexual violence. And, um, and, and, and you know, these, we, I've interviewed um, many grandmothers in our in this research work and the, um, you know, and, and some young men. And one of the uh, uh, other interesting lessons from that research work was that um, some of the young men we interviewed uh, who, who said that they felt they were uh, sexually healthy were men who were raised by their grandmothers. And so I found this very interesting that, you know, um, that the, to, to live a healthy life, you know, m mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually was that where our, our connection to our grandparents uh, was a, a very important element in developing a healthy uh, lifestyle. And so, you know, taking that, like, the sexual health is was is really a reflection of the um, the determinants that affect our health. You know, poverty, abuse, uh, lack of clean water, and so that research really um, reminded me of growing up with Nicom Caroline and the how profound she uh, impacted my life. You know, I lived with her as a little girl and, um, you know, I, when we'd go picking medicines or when we were home alone, um, she taught me to be comfortable with my body because, you know, when no one was around, when we we're out in the bush walking, she would take off her shirt and most, most of the time she didn't wear a bra and, um, we'd pick medicines like that. This is a woman who had 16 children. And you know, a, her body reflected this matriarch, you know, mother goddess. And I often think of how even that impacted my my role as an artist because one of my favorite sculptures is the Venus of Willendorf, is this like 25, 30,000 year old little goddess figurine and it's so beautiful it's such uh it, it's one of those images that um always inspires me because of 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 what it symbolized and that's her body who <laughs> reminds me of my grandmother and my grandmother uh Nukum, was just uh uh was fearless and and also loved so fiercely so when we go medicine picking, you know, seeing her in this, her element of power and beauty in the bush and uh, connecting with our relatives, you know, relatives meaning those plant nation, you know, those elements, the bird nation. Um, of course, you know, there were always things to confront when you're as an indigenous woman, especially, you know, confronting fears and trauma um, and how the residential schools, uh, so devastatingly impacted our, our family, our kinship systems. And so um, in, in my first relationship with, uh, with, my, with an ex um, who is non-Indigenous, uh, you know, there, he didn't understand a lot of our cultural ways and a lot of the things that um, he did understand was he learned from, you know, stereotypes or from you know, non-Indigenous people. And so uh, when we broke up, he had a, um, he was in a relationship with a non-Indigenous woman and, uh, and she called me one day and she asked me um, that she, you know, she said that he told her that um, Indigenous women and Native women put love medicine on their, their ex-boyfriends. <laughs> and I, um, and so she asked me if I could take my love medicine off, off of him. And uh, I was, I was shocked. One, I know um, 
that it's not good medicine. Like being accused of using love medicine is like being accused of being a, you know, a witch or, you know, it's not, it's not good to, to, um, it's not good to be accused of, of using love medicine, let alone, I didn't even know what love medicine was. Uh, and so I was, yeah, I was really upset. So I called my grandmother afterwards and I told her what happened and that I got accused of using medicine. And my grandmother responded, Natch, you go back there and you you call her back and you tell her the only medicine we as Squawak have is the, um, the only powerful medicine we have is the one between our legs. And so she, you know, and, and, and I, of course I laughed, as I mentioned, my grandmother is a very um, upfront, don't beat around the bush kind of woman. So she, I laughed and, and, uh, and, and thanked her. But how much those words um, influence the research work I'm doing has, is, I mean, it, it influences so much. And when you think about it, our wombs are are the most powerful medicine. We would no human being would exist had they not come from their mother's wombs. You know, men, women, all those genders in between, and so that important uh, teaching of kind of made me realize, oh my God, you know, I wish so many of our other women and men know that importance of that medicine and and really what that means. One of the other really best practices in talking about our medicine is through humor, right? Um, we can talk about the most saddest things and laugh through it with such grace, humility, and respect. You know, it's really, we're still evolving our, la our English language um, so we can be more inclusive. But I think when we're also learning our languages of this land, like Nehiawe Wen, or you know, our our diverse languages of indigenous languages, when we connect to learning that, then we can even evolve our English language more to bring in those values and worldviews, right? But we need to be doing it in a way that's interactive and that's creative and that is, that we be able to laugh through it. You know, how else are we gonna be able to talk about these really traumatic, um, awful history we come from without, you know, having some good, you know, laughing medicine as part of it, right? When we think, when I think of all the words that express our medicines as, you know, our, our female parts and or life-giving parts to our male life-giving parts, you know, um, I, th I, we have to laugh because it's such a descriptive, uh, it's such a descriptive action-based language. And it, and it is really funny. Like I think of Thompson the Highway who, that if you want to learn the language of love, learn French. If you want to learn the language of passion, learn Italian. But if you want to learn the language of laughter, learn Cree. And, and it's true. So, you know, it's so important to reconnect to our, our, our Nehyo Weiwen, our Cree language, and be able to, um, to be able to, to help restore some balance in our life, especially when it comes to around our sexual health. So one of the best practices in creating a space of courage to talk about the things we haven't talked about in our families or communities and within our nations, uh, even within ourselves, is having that expressive outlet through creativity. And so uh, one of the ways I've been able to um, have some good conversation with close friends and, you know, expanding my circle bigger to invite other people into those spaces is through beading and creating beaded uh, medicines and hence we started a beat up club to be able to talk about you know our medicine and so when you're actually creating um, and beading uh, well in the beginning you start with some kind of plan 
of, of working on, you know, the, our medicines. And I think about, uh, so even though this, it looks like a nice little drawing, it's actually, you know, represents our woman medicine. And it also connects us to our three generations, you know, is when a woman, as a woman or as a human being, uh, we actually began in our grandmother's womb. So when our grandmothers were pregnant with our, four months pregnant with our mothers, um, our mother started already developing eggs in, in her, you know, as a fetus. And so we were in our grandmothers. Can you imagine like the amount of knowledge we carry um, just from, because we lived in our grandmother's body. So when people kind of say, why can't you, you know, why can't you get over it, right? Of Indian residential school, of colonization, of, you know, living with racism. Why can't we get over it? It's because we've been living, it's, you know, my grandmother would have been mm, 97 years old, you know, and so for almost a hundred years, we've already been like, we're carrying that kind of, so we can't just get over a hundred years of oppression and colonization and violence and trauma. Um, but what we can do is, is, is talk about it, creating spaces of courage to be able to um, evolve our language and way of thinking of how do we now take care of our medicines. And when you're taking care of your medicines, your wombs, you're taking care of your families, you're taking care of yourselves, your spirit, you're taking care of your partner, you know? And so um, it's so important to, to unpack that trauma and talk about it. It's so important to also laugh about it. Humor is a, such an important element of, um, of being able to, to restore balance in, in thinking about, um, how do we bring our medicine back into that place of sacredness and power? And no one is going to treat your medicine with respect and love and kindness and truth until you do that for yourselves. You know, kind of goes back to that cliche of uh, you need to love yourself before you can love others. Um, but it's so important. You need to love your womb and the wounds you're connected to in order to share with others how to treat you. So on June 10th, 2020, when my uh, Nite three generations beaded medicine was stolen, uh, you know, what began kind of as this funny, like first response was this idea of like, why would someone steal a beaded medicine? You know, like, um, but then, as days went by, I started thinking about, you know, all of the, all that my Nigawi and Nukum had to go through and my great grandparents, my Anukstapanak, went through, you know, from stolen land to stolen children to <laughs> stolen bodies and how, when will this taking without consent ever end? You know, and I think about my grandmother's teachings of, you know, those beautiful teachings of our rites of passage, of moving into childhood, into adulthood, of how to be a good human being. You know, as a woman, when we come into our time, we, we have to be careful with how we walk and talk and, and work and, you know, because we're that powerful. We're so powerful, we don't need to go into ceremony because when our grandmothers visit every moon, we are in a powerful ceremony that we can heal, that we can, uh, we can rebalance a lot of the energy in, in our world or in our communities. Um, but you know, having a beaded medicine stolen is like, you're taking away that opportunity for other people to learn or reconnect or remember, you know? That's what arts does is it, uh, it starts that spark of, of connecting to spirit and things you may not know or things you've forgotten. When you look at it, our piece, you will remember. And when you remember, you know, it's kind of like spirit telling you, you know, please share now, pass on. 
I think of all the grandmothers and their wisdom they share with me and in turn I want to share through my art practices to help inspire and motivate and remind you know our relatives all our relatives of our most sacred and powerful responsibility and role in this world and a part of our prophecy is that we've now moved into this time of the woman. In the last seven generations, we've been under the time of the men, the large, the, the large dipper. And now we turned into the, the small dipper. And these are teaching from Ochi's family is uh, prophecies. And so that we are now moving in this time of the women of the small dipper, the woman's pipe. What our world needs right now is our matriarchs to be rising, to come into this place and reminding our men, our women, our all the two spirits, those genders in between of coming to help lead us into good changes of restoring balance to this, you know, world that's so drastically changing from epidemics to our environment, our, our mother earth um, changing so much. And so, you know, I'm reminded, yes, that someone took this. I don't know if it'll be returned. I mean, what's important is that I still carry the stories and that, you know, you're helping to lift these stories and that we can continue to create awareness and hopefully touch the spirits of others to help love and respect those medicines that we need to help us move forward as a nation and to get healthy and strong and powerful. So for the last, I don't know, 150, 200 years on our land, we've had so much stolen from us, as in Iceniwak, beings of this earth. This little beaded piece reflects the continuing theft or taking without consent of our people. When is enough, right? Especially when we live in a time of, of where our leadership is reclaiming and bringing back a lot of these laws of criminalizing indigenous people. The little I can do is at least to continue to honor in my creative gifts and abilities. Um, as an assistant professor, I can continue to try and share our indigenous no ways and knowing uh, in the best way possible. And I need to also do that with our own people first and, and you know, expand that so we continue to building relations. And it's hard to, you know, be inclusive, increase. In I see new work means beings of this earth so you know if you are Dakota Blackfoot you know Anishinaabe Inuit Métis if you even have a little bit of that blood of this earth you are of this earth I hope we can continue remembering that powerful medicine we come from and that we begin to honor it and return to it and lift it so it's helping us lead our peoples and and Canadians to a more kinder loving inclusive place you know canadians for since you know the signing of treaties in 1870 treaty 6 in 1876 or the treaties um before then have tried to convert us into making us european or canadians i think after 150 years of resistance it's time that canadians listen to our stories and we can help them connect to spirit and especially we can connect them through the voices of our grandmothers and uh, the voices of our, of our diverse genders, our two-spirit people. And so we need to start listening, we need to start supporting, and we need to start remembering. <laughs>